I use the visual analogy of a flower as your company in the center and, and each one of these types of partnership arrangements that you have with other companies from marketplaces down to software licensing and across the telcos. We're going to cover this today. If you're starting from scratch, you can use this as a guide to perhaps prioritize, divide and conquer, creating a partnership ecosystem. Or if your partner program is stagnant, this could give you some fresh ideas to resegment your partner ecosystem and potentially target new partners and the customers that they can help unlock for you. Hi, Daniel. Great to have you. Thanks for having me. It's it's great to have a chat. I couldn't really imagine like a better person to explain like the entire range of partnership than you are. Right, because I think uh, we, we've been knowing each other for, for, for a while. You, you've you been uh, in um, both enterprise sales and partnerships. So you worked in such iconic companies like Atlassian, Semantic, and smaller growth stage companies like Easy Agile. So I'm really excited about your presentation today. Uh, and you're going to be explaining the entire range of partnerships. But before we, we go into that, so I, I know that you have years of experience in partnerships, right? And years of experience in sales. Can you walk us a little bit more about your sort of partnership journey and your, your, your journey in tech in general? I started off as a web developer doing a comp sci degree at university and I became an accidental salesperson by uh, getting a, a job, a graduate job out of university, being a bid manager for IBM. Is very lucky to see how uh, large enterprise responses were handled by a company of that scale. And that led me into a direct sales career, which then led me into a partnerships career. Within the partnerships, what are the things that sort of ex excited you the most? I think this is, you know, a lot of partnership people kind of fell into a partnership career accidentally. I'm sort of wondering how, I, how you, you got into partnership. It's a lot more strategic. So you need to think about on a macro level, how can you excite ultimately a bunch of people that are outside of your organization about your product or your offering and get them to potentially advocate for your company within their customers. So your ability to have an impact uh, partnering with many organizations is far greater than a bunch of individuals uh, working directly with the end user. The leverage ultimately is is what excites me about the partner space. I know that you've been working on a bunch of other sort of interesting initiatives that are sort of outside of the discussion, but uh, I'm sure that uh, we'll see a lot of great things from you. But but uh, but for now, I'll give you a floor and then I look forward to learning from, from you about different type of partnerships. And then, then we'll do a Q&A in the end. So I'll, I guess we will have like another sort of 20 minutes. The floor is yours. Uh, give it to me. What I'm going to speak to, to you all today is about what I've dubbed the pedals of partnerships. So it's essentially a, a template or a boilerplate for, for IT partnerships. I use the visual analogy of a flower and its petals. This visual analogy has your company in the center and, and each one of these types of partnership arrangements that you have with other companies reaching out into the marketplace and extending the reach of your organization. So from marketplaces uh, down to software licensing and across the telcos, we're going to cover this today and we'll follow that up with some Q&A with Roman at the end. And just to ease into the main part of the presentation, I'm still going to just describe who is this for uh, I'm going to take you through a feel good, a philosophy and a truth. Uh, and these are some of the things that I think about when uh, sculpting or working within a partner ecosystem. Uh, and then I'll go through uh, a summary of the partnerships or petals of partnerships template. As mentioned, you know, I started at IBM, uh, went through and, and they sold their PC division to Lenovo. Uh, which I was a part of, which created the first Chinese multinational company uh, and then found myself working as a partner manager in federal government at Symantec. Uh, this led me on to a regional partner manager role at Atlassian a few years later. And within Atlassian, uh, 
I then moved to become an enterprise sales manager across the APAC and the Americas. Uh, and after spending six years at Atlassian, I, I then moved on to be a part of essentially a successful startup, Easy Agile, and was a head of partnerships and helped create them form their partner program. Who is this for? Uh, it's anyone who's interested in software and hardware partnerships. And when it comes to software, you may be selling SaaS or on-prem software. Uh, and together with hardware, there's sections which hit all parts uh, for you. So if you're starting from scratch, uh, you can use this as a guide to perhaps prioritize, divide and conquer, uh, creating a partnership ecosystem. Or if your partner program is stagnant, uh, this could give you some fresh ideas uh, to resegment your partner ecosystem and potentially target new partners and, and, and the customers that they can help unlock for you. Moving back to the feel good, the philosophy and the truth. And I'll start with the feel good. And that's to let you all know that you are a snowflake. Uh, your situation is unique. And when sculpting a, a, a partner program, you need to think about your company, the product, uh, the competition, the macro environment, environment, and you really need to curate your own strategy. So, Potentially taking what others have done or what you've done previously may not work for you in your current environment. So think of your situation and see what's out there and build your own scenario. I'll lead now into a philosophy or the way I think of uh, how organizations partner and how they manage human capital. Um, and that's by, you know, starting to think about who works for you. And generally speaking, you know, you have employees that you pay every month um, that are paid to deliver a task. Contractors have a similar arrangement when it comes to pay. They know that they've got to deliver a project or a certain amount of time. Uh, but your partners, well, these organizations that you work with are generally paid later. So unlike your employees and contractors who are generally paid up front, your partners are paid later. And they are paid later after they've invested their time and render services. And only if they're successful in meeting a customer's requirements are they paid. So in order to motivate your partners, they need to be able to see the opportunity. So that motivation can come from the product fit, that your product has in the market, the incentives that you have in your partner program, ultimately they need to see some kind of return on investment in working with your organization. And now leading on to the last bit of this section, and that's a truth. You need to understand that any customer you're, that you're trying to get through to already has a relationship with at least one industry Goliath. And that's either Google or Microsoft. So uh, be aware that how your customers are going to purchase uh, is generally dictated by who they hand their check to for their email infrastructure. And that will be Gmail if it's Google or Outlook and Exchange if it's Microsoft. And their relationship with one of these titans will set the tone on how they make IT investments moving forward. So. I use an example of, you know, a company potentially looking at a new chat app. Th their likelihood of purchasing Slack will be far lower if they are already purchasing email services from Microsoft who may bundle in Teams already as part of that email infrastructure uh, licensing arrangement. So keep this in mind uh, when you're sculpting a, a partner environment. Before I move on to the pedals of partnerships, I mean, Roman, any kind of things you want to discuss? I really loved your, your, your last point about setting the tone for partnerships, right? Uh, by selecting as simple as email provider, right? Can you elaborate on that in terms of like, does it um, frame 
partnership philosophy or does it sort of attach to a specific vendor? What do you mean by that? As a company grows, often when they're, when they're entering commercial arrangements with either Google or Microsoft, uh, these organizations have a great way of adding on products or value uh, as the contract grows and gets renewed every, every year or every few years. So, you know, if you're aligned with a particular stack that, stack that may create opportunities, if you know that, you know, your product works well or complements some of these Microsoft products, the Microsoft ecosystem may be a great place to start for you to work with. Uh, alternatively, it may, may be a place that you need to consciously avoid or not invest a lot of time into. So just be aware that they're there. Uh, how significant a relationship they may have with some of the customers that you're targeting, you know, you'll find that out eventually. But at a macro level, uh, it may influence some of the decisions you make and where you invest your time. And that may, may be like previewing your uh, second part of, the, of, your, of your presentation and connecting this with Snowflake mentality, right? And uh, I agree with you that every company is unique, but uh, when you started, in, as a new partnership manager in like Easy Agile or maybe Atlassian, how did you come about sort of mapping the, the, the ecosystem on like figuring out what is the first targets or like first uh, initial partners or set of partners you you would want to target? Like how do you approach sort of directionally this, this question? Great place to start is with what you got and audit how those relationships are going and seeing if there's opportunity to grow them uh, and really there these are organizations if the company's already had an, a relationship with them you have a great chance to uh, invest in those existing relationships sometimes if you've inherited some partnerships they may not be the ones that you'll be able to invest in moving forward um, so really take stock of what you have there could be some gems there and make a decision to continue to invest in them, help them grow, listen to them, right? Ask them, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What could we do better? Where do you see opportunity? And generally you'll find when polling these partners, uh, you'll, you've got to give them time. You've got to build trust with them, but you, you'll find where you need to place your bets moving forward. We'll keep this discussion, Paul, sales intersect with partnerships in the end, because I think it's going to be a longer discussion. Like how do you convert maybe some clients into partners? Uh, and like, how do you like uh, overlay partnerships on top of uh, product like growth and stuff like that? But yeah, please continue. Let's now talk about the pedals of partnerships. As I mentioned, this is a structure or the way I, I, I can visualize uh, a partner program extending from a company. I'm going to talk through each one of these types of pedals or partner routes. I'm going to preface this that there are a lot of gray areas here that uh, when I'm speaking about one of these areas, I'm generalizing and there could be some overlap with the other the other areas. And I guess even the, the picture that you see on the screen describes some of that too. So, I'm, I'm going to start in, in, you know, perhaps the most relevant uh, type of partner model right now, and that's um, marketplaces. And that's marketplaces through apps and p platforms. So the key traits of this type of partnership uh, is that a software vendor opens up their software to a third-party extensions that work on or can be sold through their platform. And the most famous example of this is the Apple App Store. They really pioneered this model. But for enterprise software, you know, there's a bunch of these out there, including the AWS Marketplace. Shout out to the Atlassian Marketplace, who lets you purchase uh, third-party software and, and, and uh, deliver it through their, their apps and platforms. So here... One of these vendors essentially curates the product experience and extends their existing transactional relationship to, to a, a third party, which could be your company. So, um, you know, these companies have gone up and set up a platform 
um, for their existing customers to to effectively receive the same invoices, but for your product through through their platform. Um, so just to describe, you know, the level of expertise that these organizations will have in your product will be low uh, by nature because their marketplaces and they're often global, so their geographic reach is high. The amount of time you're going to have to spend training an organization that you partner with uh, on, a, on, a, on their marketplace will, will be low. Um, but your internal investment in setting up on, on uh, a route through a marketplace will be high. So you may have to do some things on a technical front, invest in your code base to be able to support this, your billing systems to support this. Uh, there'll be a high internal investment. Could be even some contracts you'll need to review. And generally speaking, the software margin, if you're, if you're a software vendor, uh, you'll probably have to give away 20 to 30% margin. Uh, that seems to be the industry standard when selling through an up marketplace. I'm going to move along to technology alliances. Uh, where this differs from the marketplaces is that generally speaking, this is an intra-vendor relationship uh, that may take place in terms of uh, a vendor alliance. So, uh, you may OEM your product or whitelist your product and whitelisting is where uh, that software vendor you're working with rebrands your product and sells it as their own or integrations, you, you may decide to integrate with their products or become API partners. So there's a few different examples in this arena. Uh, I'll use a, a hardware example first and that's HP deciding to partner with Norton and they and that's to you know install antivirus software or security software on any device that a potential customer may want to activate once they've gone home and brought a new computer home um, and that's two vendors working together um, HP protecting their customers by by giving them best in class security products uh, where we move to the other side of the equation, um, HubSpot may decide to work with MailChimp to build an in tight integration between their products. And the objective of this type of uh, arrangement between HubSpot and, and MailChimp would probably be to align with the strategic direction that both companies have, uh, where you know one plus one equals three, and for them, the reason where they may want to do this is because by partnering and having tight integration between their products, uh, this could help them have a better story against a competitor such as Salesforce and their marketing offerings. So uh, it complements both companies with what they're trying to achieve. And generally speaking, uh, the expertise each company will have in each other's products will be will be low, um, but the geographical reach of this type of arrangement is high. It's often global. Uh, each company probably won't need to train staff uh, tremendously heavily uh, to get this going, but there will be an internal investment. So you'll have to set up, you know, maybe a bespoke uh, contract to get an arrangement like this going. Uh, if you're dealing with software, uh, there will need to be some um, uh, technical overhead there to make sure that your apps speak to each other. And coming down to software margin, uh, there may be no margin given away in this arrangement, like the HubSpot and the MailChimp example that I used. That could help both of them grow their respective market. So there's, there's actually no transaction taking place. Coming back to the Norton example on a HP PC, you know, there could be maybe 30% of each license transaction for Symantec going back to HP. I'm going to talk about value-added resellers in a second. Uh, I'll pause there. I mean, any questions? We can use Atlassian as, as an example, right? Or like I just profiled Zoom recently. So Zoom would, would or like Atlassian would mention a couple of companies like Slack, for example, as, as a alliance partner or like zoom would mention dropbox as an alliance sort of uh, partner uh i'm sort of wondering how 
this type of integrations and relationships are different between just sort of integrations through marketplace versus like strategic alliance. I understand that there's a big difference in contracts, but in terms of technical integrations and uh, how companies train their workforce to to sort of push each other product, how they're different. In the example I use is, is generally with the marketplaces, uh, they're transacting through a platform or a marketplace to reach an end user. So there is an exchange of, of money and that's from a customer, you know, going through through the marketplace provider, which could be Zoom or Slack. And then, you know, ultimately the check being handed over to, to either Zoom or Slack, but there's a transaction taking place uh, with an integration partner. Uh, often it's bespoke. So with a marketplace, that vendor has decided to uh, architect a marketplace and have a standard set of APIs and a standard way of doing things where many vendors have to work uh, using and within that structure. Integrating your products could be a little bit more bespoke or there may not be a transaction there uh, and you may pick and choose who, who you may want to work with. Thanks so much for explaining. The, the reason I sort of ask is because the, the, the outcome seems to be similar for customers, right? So customer, for example, in the case of Atlassian and Slack or or HubSpot and, and MailChimp, it, as a result, we'll be able to use both products, right? And maybe like have sort of one uh, or maybe like separate uh, invoices to to pay for both of them. But, but fundamentally, on the on the background, the relationship seems to be quite different. So the- Speaking to the Atlassian and Slack relationship, there is a mutually beneficial interest to have those products tightly integrated, but they're both enormous entities. Um, so Slack is not actively looking to sell through the Atlassian marketplace. You can't you can't purchase Slack through through that marketplace. It would also mean that Slack foregoes a, a big chunk of margin to be able to do that. Uh, and ultimately, it's not working on the Atlassian products as well. So that's generally um, a, a key differentiator. Your, your products are generally installed and working on on the products marketplace you're selling through too. Thanks so much for, for, for explaining. Please, yeah. please continue. Let's talk a little bit about value-added resellers. And this is probably the most common form of software or hardware partnership that's out there. And the way I think of these partnerships is where your product is paired with uh, another company's human capital uh, to deliver an offering or a service. So uh, often... You know, these organizations have uh, domain expertise, and I'll get to that in a second, and some geographical reach, and that could come in the form of an architect or someone that's a real expert living in your local city um, up to an organization which may have, you know, in, in the United States, a particular field of expertise they, they that they're really great at. So let's say IT service management or application lifecycle management, and they're right across the Americas. Generally speaking, value-added resellers, it's really hard to find a value-added reseller organization that you can partner with that has awesome uh, domain expertise right around the world. And if you find one of them, that's going to be a unicorn. So grab a hold of them. But... Their key traits are that they're small to medium-sized services businesses uh, with key strengths in a subject domain, industry vertical, or region. So some examples of of companies that are uh, large VARs, uh, CDW, SHI, Dimension Data, uh, who are in the Middle East and Africa, Data3, who are in Australia, and they position themselves as as subject matter experts in certain fields or verticals and their expertise is often medium to high uh, in what they do. Unfortunately, their their geographical reach because they are often experts in what they do is low to medium. So when I say low to medium, either in a city or a region or a country, um, 
but let's say if you're in Europe or North America, uh, generally speaking, they're not cross geography. Uh, your training investment in uh, fostering uh, value-added resellers and their know-how in your products is going to be medium to high. So there'll be probably many of them scattered around the world. And therefore, your internal investment in managing them will be high. Um, there'll be many of these organisations uh, uh, in different time zones You'll need to create a partner program with some structure, rules, guidelines, uh, formalized training, and that will take a considerable amount of investment. Your software margin is, is often dependent upon what type of partner program you do architect, and it's uh, these days generally sculpted off skill or sales volume or a blend of both. Uh, but you're probably going to give away if you have a software business between 15 to 30 percent margin to a, to your value added resellers. I'm going to speak about distributors now, and I would say that in the current SaaS climate, um, distribution partners are, are probably overlooked, um, and. There's an opportunity here for particularly smaller organisations to really pair with, with distribution partners that have been around for a while. Um, and these distribution partners do not sell to customers directly. They, in essence, aggregate uh, access to hundreds or thousands of, of essentially VARs in a region. And uh, for... It, for hardware, if you're a hardware company and looking to partner with a distribution partner, they will also potentially buffer local inventory. Uh, some established names that are distribution partners uh, include Ingram Micro, uh, TD Synex, Westcon Comstore, Exertus, uh, and there can be niche players there. Uh, my former manager from IBM and Lenovo, Neil, g'day Neil. Uh, started a Internet of Things distributor in Australia and that business is called Supply and they focus simply in working with organisations in that vertical. So beyond these big names, there's niche players out there that may work in your vertical. Uh, the value of these organisations is that they can manage a lot of transactions and a, a lot of regional relationships and that's particularly advantageous, especially if you're dealing in, in non-English speaking markets or currencies beyond the US dollar or euro. And they're, they're, they have excellent logistics capability for hardware. So often because of these strengths, their expertise in, in knowing your products is often low. Um, their geographical reach is often low to medium, so to a country level. Uh, or a regional level, but often not global. Uh, a couple of these organizations do work globally. Uh, your training investment with them in, in teaching them about your products will be low uh, and your internal investment is, is going to be also low because of that. And so will your software margin if you're a software company. Uh, moving on to another type of uh, a of partner that is also often looked overlooked in the SaaS space is what I would class as software licensing partners. And these organizations, their key trait is that they assist very large organizations or government to procure and manage software licenses. Uh, so if you're a, a large bank with many offices around the world, with potentially people making procurement decisions independently in these locations. Uh, they may be buying software from the same vendor in another country. Uh, organizations like Software One, Insight, and Carasoft, who are US based, may be able to help you aggregate that. And they actually have expertise in software licensing. And some of the larger vendors even require audit compliance. So, you know, if you're a large company, please tell us exactly how many of our licenses have you deployed and where are they? So they can actually help you maintain compliance. Um, so uh, 
These organizations may also have access to purchasing panels, particularly in government. Carasoft does that very well in the United States. So they can unlock uh, selling through to the US government for you there. Uh, Data3 can do that for you as well in Australia. Uh, so their expertise uh, is generally in, in, in knowing about your products as low to medium uh, because they will want to know how your product is licensed and sold. Their geographical reach is there for low to medium. Uh, you're probably not going to have to spend a lot of time training them beyond how your products are procured and sold, and therefore your internal investment and margin will be low. I'll move through to what I dub as consulting partners. And the key trait here is that they're generally the big four um, audit firms with, and they have key CFO relationships because, because of the nature of the work that they, they undertake um, within that accounting realm. And these organisations, uh, how they're structured is they work under the partner ownership model where over time uh, an employee will eventually acquire a stake in the company. They'll be a part owner and often there'll be thousands uh, of, of these people who are part owners. Uh, some examples of companies in this arena are Accenture, Deloitte, PwC, Capgemini, and EY. Now, I included Accenture and Capgemini here. I know they're not a big four audit firm, but their DNA and how they're structured and how they work um, come out of Arthur Anderson, um, which links back to Accenture, and Capgemini, I believe, was also linked to EY. So their culture is is really linked to how these these companies operate and how they uh, approach their customers is also similar. So often these firms uh, work with an organisation and partner with their strategic in initiatives. Um, their expertise is is very high. Often they have many architects, architect level skill sets within their environments and their geographical reach is high. Many of these firms have hundreds of thousands of employees. Uh, therefore, your trading investment is also going to be high. So finding where these employees are, who are they, is, is a job in itself. So your internal investment is often going to be high too. Um, but the value that they can bring to your company and your customers is high. So they're, they're, the margin that they command is, is generally in the higher end, so about 30% if you're a software company. Now, I'll talk about system integrators. Where I, where I perceive the consulting partners and the system integrators differ is system integrators generally pitch to their customers and say, hey, we have the capacity to take over your entire IT organization. And these organizations are also extremely large. Um, you may have heard of Fujitsu, DXC, Lidos, Unisys, Wipro, Infosys. Uh, when they approach their customers, they're, or they're, take, they're telling them that they can take care of the full stack of their IT needs. So, you know, if you've got client devices and you're a bank, uh, you may not want to be worrying about laptops scattered all around Europe. Uh, you may decide that you'll hand over a check to Fujitsu to take care of this work for you and everything that runs on those devices. You may do the same for your data centers. You may do the same for your mobile devices or, or all of the above. Um, these organizations have, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees and they, they work with their customers to take uh, IT uh, infrastructure and the management of that off their hands if that's not their core business. So their expertise is often medium to high. The, the geographical reach is high. Uh, you're going to have to spend some time investing in, in training them. Uh, they're, they're pretty self-sufficient actually. So your internal investment can be medium to high um, and software margin, again, will be on the higher end. Last but not least, uh, this one is also overlooked uh, and that's uh, telcos and uh, 
you know, you may have heard of Verizon, T-Mobile, BT, Orange, Telstra, or NTT. Uh, these organizations generally have a billing relationship with all of your customers. And if you're not focused on enterprise, uh, perhaps consumer, they've probably got a rela billing relationship with end consumers as well. So uh, if if it's appropriate, their, their, their value to you is that uh, unlocking some of these billing relationships they they may have could could help sell your product through their customers. And they do have expertise on the consumer device level and enterprise services that complement their carrier services. So if you're a software company or hardware company with a networking product or a security product or a messaging product, uh, that complements what they're offering as carriers. And they may be interested in partnering, partnering with you and offering uh, your services as part of a package to their customers. So generally speaking, the expertise uh, that they'll have in your products, uh, they're, they're focused on their own. Uh, so it will be low to medium. Uh, geographical reach is low to medium. Often it's, it's down to a country level. Uh, your training investment with them will be low unless it, it becomes something really strategic and your internal investment will be medium, often contract heavy um, when, you're, when you're trying to enter an arrangement with one of these companies and the margin that they command is high. Uh, so I'll leave that at there and I'll close out, uh, you know, the pedal to partnerships and, and just open it to some discussion with you, Roman. First of all, thank you so much for, for um, just looking at us through the entire range of different partnerships. Um, it's really interesting and uh, I think it's very detailed breakdown, super helpful. I think the way I sort of feel about partnerships today is that there's almost like two type of groups of partnership people. One of them is sort of guys with a lot of experience, maybe like coming from channel. Uh, and there's a new group of partnership people who are kind of coming from uh, sort of new SaaS world, right? Uh, and I think you you mentioned a couple of uh, type of partnerships like distribution, which are like often overlooked. And I'm sort of curious, how do you think if you, for example, a SaaS company, right? And you as a partnership manager in SaaS company, how would you explore uh, this maybe legacy or like kind of existing channels that are not that many people sort of exploring like dis distributors or system integrators? Would you like, how would you approach doing that? If you're interested in going global, that's a great place to start. So often many large companies in countries outside of the United States will, will need to make sure that their software vendors meet certain requirements. Um, some of that could be even, you know, an invoice that's local and issued by a local local organization. Um, there may be a language barrier. There may be a currency barrier. Uh, and these types of organizations can help you navigate some of the, some of the complexities on this procurement front uh, very quickly. They can also link you up with many local partners as well. So if you don't have people on the ground, they do, and they can help identify who the relevant people are that you should be working with in their area uh, very fast. So for SaaS companies, it can help unlock uh, new markets very quickly and, and remove some of those, those barriers. Let's touch about sort of the difference between, again, sort of newer, more exciting channels like app marketplaces. So every VC and a lot of companies and a lot of people in channel talk about app marketplaces. Exciting new energy is going into that. But at the same time, system integrators or like uh, well edited resellers are not getting uh, as much sort of attention. So can, can you maybe like touch a little bit in terms of like how are those types of partnerships are sort of evolving. Where, where do you see it sort of going? If, if, you, if you look into the last, you know, like maybe like 10 years, what are the things that sort of emerge and which are the things that are kind of getting less, less uh, successful? With the emergence of AWS and 
GCP, et cetera, a lot of those organizations had heavy expertise in helping clients manage infrastructure. And that's slowly, slowly going away. So everything's running on the cloud. You got, you know, platforms, cloud platforms, SaaS products on the cloud. Uh, the level of complexity isn't there like it was 20 years ago. Um, but there is a desire for some organizations to, to get away from, you know, being distracted by things that are not their core business. Uh, an auto manufacturer wants to ma make cars and that is their sole purpose for existing. So having armies of people managing IT environments around the world is probably not going to be interesting to their executive team. And if an organization external to them can do that better than their company, that's always going to remain attractive regardless of how the technology changes. So there, there has to be a bit of respect by, you know, some of these new partnership models that you kind of need to do both. Yes, you do need that app marketplace as well because particularly within small to medium business, mid-size enterprise, that will be okay for them. If you want to crack large enterprise, uh, often some of these legacy structures uh, are going to remain attractive to them, working with them, system integrators, consulting firms. They're not going anywhere. They'll be around for a long time and they've got a reason to exist. So you've got to be respectful for that. Very good point. Talking about consulting, um, I was surprised to see that, a little bit surprised to see McKinsey hiring like a first CTO coming from, I think Microsoft, if I'm not mistaken. And then before that, they acquired Salesforce implementation company. Generally speaking, consulting as a, as a, as a channel seems to be overlooked. And I think Atlassian builds pretty sizable business with the help of people consulting on top of Atlassian software and then Airtable and Asana and then many others. How do you see a consulting channel, consulting companies are changing their business model? Uh, what is happening there? They've always been focused on outcomes. So often when they're, when they're uh, offering a solution to a problem, so a company is looking to solve their inventory and inventory is really important for their balance sheet and they're going to start with that problem and then work backwards and see technology as an enabler. What, and you need to kind of make sure that they're aware of your technology if it can solve, help solve that inventory problem. I use that as an example, but a CFO will be really interested in, in reducing their inventory and that could be a strategic initiative. I mean, right now that could be really hot with everything that's going on with supply chains. So getting these consulting firms to analyze, you know, the elasticity of inventory, what tools are out there that can help us predict that uh, if you're in the business of selling software that can help them achieve those outcomes with their customers, get out there and let them know. How do you do that? I, I mean, like, if I sort of start thinking, okay, I want McKinsey or like, let's say Accenture to, to know that I exist. Like, how do I get into that consideration? Often there'll be a practice manager who, who may be in charge of a particular technology stack or vertical. So uh, if, we, if we extend upon, you know, that inventory analogy, uh, there could be somebody that is running supply chains expertise within McKinsey. So you may want to get in touch with them or let them know what you can offer in that space. I'm sure there's a lot of people <laughs> managing supply chain in McKinsey. One of the most interesting like points that uh, I wanted to discuss with you because you have balanced experience between enterprise sales and partnerships. How do you see this sort of partnerships uh, intersect with uh, product-led growth and maybe like how sales kind of come into picture, how they, they all interact at scale? Ultimately, you're looking for, for feedback on your product. We, we at Atlassian ran partner councils, received a lot of feedback from our partners. Our partners were both sitting in the, many of our partners were sitting in that services realm and they featured also on our app marketplace. So we were getting 
uh, feedback on our product at a technical level because they were maybe building on it. Uh, they were then giving us feedback as well on what they were seeing out there in the field when they were delivering those pro our products to their customers. So making sure those feedback loops were strong between your partner community and you as a vendor is extremely powerful. They may be seeing things that you'd never have thought of out there in the ecosystem. So it um, could, be, could be strange things like, uh, hey, your product doesn't render very well with the language pack that you've deployed to my region. Simply the characters don't look the right way on the screen. Uh, mm -hmm. It could be latency. Uh, of a SaaS product being delivered in their region. It could be a multiple a multitude of things that you're not seeing at a headquarters level. So keeping the door open to them and having a structure, uh, that's really important for them to be able to share feedback with your company. But in terms of like sort of adding sales and adding partnerships uh, into like product-led organization, when do you think is sort of the right time to maybe deploy or maybe like just explore uh, this sort of channel? I don't think they're binary. I think they need to work together, right? So if there's a sales team within an organization working to achieve a goal with a customer, if a partner's also working there, they need to work together. You know, the, the product-led growth component, there could be some candid conversations that a customer may be more willing to have with a partner um, simply because they do not represent the vendor directly. So you may, you may get some very direct feedback uh, coming back to you with things that may not have been said. Uh, it may work the other way as well with, with, with a customer willing to unlock uh, with the vendor directly um, it depends on the situation. That's why I feel uh, these things are not completely apart. Look, I guess my, my, my last question uh, is sort of looking into the future of partnerships and uh, sort of like having under the belt, you know, extensive experience that, 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 that you have kind of uh, in, in, in all different facets of, of, of technologies like partnerships and sales. So... What are you sort of excited about looking in the next three to five years? There's some bleeding edge technologies out there that have challenges that we've never seen before. I mean, look at look at now the open AI initiative with some of the data sets that'll be getting pushed there. Maybe not immediately. Um, we'll see things materialize, but there's going to be the need for strong capability out there. Uh, People, people uh, being experts and showing companies how they can use this bleeding technology within their organization to become efficient. Um, so, you know, the next five to 10 years, I mean, often there always seems to be this paradigm or something that's always hot in technology, right? So a few years ago, it was 3D printing, uh, you know, we went we went through crypto now as well with the blockchain. People were scratching their heads around how that could actually impact the enterprise. I still I don't think that's dead, but what's actually commercially viable will still come out. Uh, and maybe we're going to go through the same thing. You know, the current hot thing seems to be AI. So having companies that can really pair uh, the commercialization of new technology like this is, is going to be interesting. Um, uh, I don't think, you know, you'll need to be doctorate level, but uh, you'll really need to be an expert in, in, in really finding a place for these new technologies in an organization and showing a, a CIO, a CFO, a CEO, how that can help them grow their business and help them become more efficient, deliver new products. So it's, it's exciting. I mean, it's a great industry to work in. Something's always changing. And this is going to be an interesting one to look at over the next five years and see if it can be commercialized en masse and, and be something that's tangible. And there'll be a bunch of companies that will come out of this and, and work with customers to help them deliver those visions.
completely agree with you. Just, just to keep things kind of balanced between big, like three consulting companies, um, you know, I, I, I noticed that BCG is now doubling down on Metaverse and they do like consulting for enterprise about Metaverse. You know, I kind of grow in technology, so that, that will be interesting. But yeah, look, uh, great session today. Thank you so much. I, I, I learned personally a lot and, uh, and uh, I'm sure that a lot of people w- would love to connect with you. What is the best way to connect with you? Add me to LinkedIn. If you got some specific questions, just ping me, happy to help. Um, and we can chat there. So hope you found it useful. If you want to know anything else, just connect with me there. Amazing. Thanks so much.